Hello, everyone. Um, welcome. Uh, my name is Brian Colvin, and welcome to Mercyhurst University. Um, this is part of our Eclipse lecture series. Um, today's lecture is going to be unveiling the cosmos, the science behind the eclipse. And I'd like to welcome to the stage uh, Dr. Clint Jones, uh, Dr. Joe Johnson, Dr. Bradley Treese, and Dr. Nick Lang. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thank you for coming. Um, is everybody excited about the eclipse? Yeah. Hopefully, we'll have good weather. I would like today's weather on Monday. So, um, We're each going to present a little bit uh, different topics on the science behind the eclipse. I'm going to start out with just scaling it for us. Um, if you're interested in a scale model, there is one right outside of Trinity Green, right to the west of that. It starts with the sun, of course, moves all the way out past the west gates of campus, and in the median is Pluto. I didn't feel like right putting it on campus because technically not a planet anymore. Um, I know there's some strong feelings out there about that. So, um, yeah, I want to do a scale model. Um, and um, I'm going to ask for a volunteer from the audience. So, uh, you know, if you're thinking you don't want to come up, you can run and hide now. Um, what's going to happen on Monday, of course, is the moon will find its way between the sun and the earth. And this is certainly not to scale, which is what I want to bring to your attention today. We see a lot of these models, and I, I want to give a realistic representation of that. And you can see that we have um, a full eclipse here, and that is luckily where Erie, Pennsylvania will be um, on Monday. And other places have partial eclipses. Um, you can see the shadow kind of spreads out there from the sunlight um, and the moon blocking it. So eclipses um, are not completely rare. Um, you know, the Earth is mostly water. Um, these do happen more often than you think, and I believe my colleagues are going to talk about that uh, coming up. There are different types of eclipses. Um, there's, of course, the total eclipse, which we expect to see on Monday. And many times um, through one's lifetime, you may see a partial eclipse. And that's when the sun is partially in front of the moon. That's what a lot of the United States will see, um, especially in the south, in the north um, of us. Uh, we're lucky this time to be in the path of totality. And also there's an annular eclipse. It's not an annual. It's an annular based on uh, the word for ring. And it looks like a, a ring cut out of the sun because the moon is partially blocking this. Um, so why don't we have a total eclipse every single time? Well, it has to do with perfect alignment. Um, first of all, we're lucky that the moon and the sun are the same size in the sky to us. So that the, the moon can block the sun. You know, imagine if the moon were, were closer or the sun were further away we'd have more of a chance to have a total eclipse every time, right? Um, but if the moon were smaller and the sun were larger, we'd never have a total eclipse. So we're lucky there. Um, now, the universe set that up for us. But another thing to consider is the angle, okay? So Earth, of course, is... Can you guys hear me? And you can see that depiction here if we look at the different orientations we can have for uh, the plane of the Earth-Moon orbit and then the Earth-Sun orbit. So all of this has to be aligned. The, the universe 
has to be in perfect alignment. Okay? So that's the other thing to consider. If it's off, we will not have a total eclipse. We may not even have a partial eclipse or an annular eclipse. Okay? All right, let's talk about scale. Um, the sun, obviously, very big. Um, if you added up all of the masses in the entire solar system, each planet, you were able to weigh them and weigh the sun at the same time, the sun would be 99% of the total mass in the solar system. Uh, it's definitely the largest object out there. Um, relative to the Earth and the moon, that's the way it looks. Um, the Earth is right here in the center, just represented by, it looks like a little diamond. The moon is barely visible. The sun actually has um, a little acne problem sometimes. It has blemishes. These are called sunspots. Um, so the Earth is roughly the size of a small sunspot. We're, we're tiny compared to that. Um, so given this, I, I want to I take you through a scale model. Okay, so um, I need one volunteer. Anybody out there want to volunteer? I don't see any hands. I know some names. Okay, come on up. Okay, what's your name? Tim. Tim. Welcome, Tim. Where are you from? I'm from Minneapolis. going to represent our Earth. It's made of basketball. Uh, conveniently, and, and this is a, in a lot of textbooks, what scales appropriately to that, which is about one-fourth of the diameter of the Earth, is a sunspot. And we're going to talk about the distance between the Earth and the Moon first, and then I'll first talk about the Earth and the Moon. So I'm going to have you hold it. You're going to do the Earth. And it turns out if you wrap a piece of string around a tennis ball, roughly, it represents the distance between the Earth and its orbiting communication center. This is how far they are away. And you're like, wow, that's a long way. So I'm going to show you. Because we're going to do the Earth and the Moon now. Okay? So I'm going to be the Moon. Let's go all the way over. The Earth and the Moon. On this scale, so it's roughly 25 feet. And now imagine we have the Sun. Okay, would anyone like to guess where the sun is? About 390 times the distance from the Earth to the moon. Pittsburgh. Pittsburgh, closer than that. Yes? Oh, okay, we're getting closer. Edinburgh? Okay, closer. If you scale it to that, it would be from here to roughly 12th Street. 1.8 miles. And the sun would be roughly the size of a hot air balloon, right in the middle of the diameter. Um, so that's our scale model. And it's a very realistic one with the, with the basketball and the tennis ball.
Incidentally, if you were to take an orange and a poppy seed to represent the earth and the sun, which is a pretty good analogy as well, our closest star, the closest star to us, which takes 4.3 light years, 4.3 years for that light to reach the earth, on this scale it would be in Pittsburgh. And we can't even get to Mars. So, young people, new generation of scientists, get to work. (laughs) All right. I appreciate your attention. I hope that helps bring things into a different perspective for you. Thank you, Tim. Um, I would like to introduce my colleagues, Dr. Joe Johnson and Dr. Brad Treese for the next part of this talk. Thank you. I'm going to save this for later. He gets a bowling ball, I get a racquetball. That doesn't seem fair. That's not us. That's not us. That's us. That's, that's what I'm talking about. That's us. Thank you, Dr. Jones. Thank you all for coming. I'm Dr. Joe Johnson. This is Dr. Brad Treese. Dr. Diane Jones is right there, and that's the entire Mercy Earth Physics Department right here in this room. Uh, arguably the best department on campus. Some people say that. Most of them are on the stage right now. Um, but I've heard that. I've heard people say it. That's the one. That's one. Um, <laughs> so, uh, as Dr. Jones said, we're all super excited about this eclipse. We've been talking about it for over a year now, I think, and um, it's like right on our doorstep. It's days away. I literally can't wait. I'm, I'm shaking with excitement, not just because I'm in front of an audience of people. I'm also very excited about this eclipse because an eclipse is a phenomenon that makes us feel both infinitesimally small, because that scale you're talking about is mind-boggling, and I don't even appear on that scale. I'm not even a pixel on the screen. But at the exact same time, I'm made of the same stuff that is making this happen, and I'm capable as this a blob of mass who exists on this planet to understand it, and we as humans have been predicting them with accuracy without even being out there in space. For hundreds of years, we've been predicting them and observing them and understanding them at deeper and new levels. Understanding things that um, you wouldn't even imagine could happen because of this phenomenon, and that's one of the things we're going to talk about today. And not only that, it doesn't happen every day. Dr. Jones said they do happen more frequently than we might expect, but it doesn't happen every day, it doesn't happen every month, it doesn't even happen every year. It won't happen again here for over 100 years. Why not? I mean, the moon's up there every day, the sun's up there every day. Why, don't, why doesn't this happen here all the time? That's another thing we're going to talk about. So, as Dr. Jones was saying, the sun is very far away, but it appears the same size as the moon in the sky. So, that can be kind of confusing because we as humans deal with scales that are like normal. Like I deal with stuff in like feet and meters and miles. I can understand that. But we're talking about light years. We're talking about how far light travels at 186,000 miles per second in a year. <laughs> That's hard for me to imagine. So dealing with that scale is difficult to comprehend. So we look at this and we say, oh, they're the same size. When they are vastly different sizes. As Dr. Jones was saying, 392 times bigger. The sun is that much bigger than the moon. So how does it, how are they roughly the same size? How is that possible? Yeah. So to get a little bit of an idea how this works, um, I'm going to suggest that you hold up your thumb. We have a picture of the sun here. And just play around a little bit. Move your thumb toward you, away from you. And um, what you'll see is you have to really strike just the right balance in order to get that sun covered almost perfectly. And so that balancing act is exactly what's going on when we're dealing with solar eclipses. Question for you in the audience. Was your thumb close to your eye or close to the sun? The sun is obviously much bigger than my thumb is. But uh, in order to cover it up, do I want to be closer to the sun or closer to my eyeball? 
Yes, and the closer you get to your eyeballs, the larger the angle that it covers, right? The larger of my field, the more of my field of vision is covered up. So, and so um, that balance that you strike, if you even just change it a little bit, you can go from just perfectly covering the sun to not quite covering it at all. Or, well, you're still covering most of it, but you get a nice little ring around the edge of your thumb, right? And so this is exactly the difference when, when you hear uh, total eclipse versus annular, annular eclipse of uh, what the difference between the two is. So in a total eclipse, you're completely covering the sun, and with just a like, little faint ring around it, um, we'll talk a little bit about what that is. And uh, when it's annular, you're still covering, you know, 90, 95% of it, but the sun is very bright, so the amount that gets around um, still looks quite bright in the sky. I got to go to Odessa, Texas last October and see an annular eclipse. I was in the path of totality. It was really cool, admittedly. You put the glasses on, you see the ring of fire. It was really neat. I took a picture of it. It turned out really good. But uh, looking around, it just looked like daytime with a bunch of people standing around looking at the sun, which is admittedly unusual. But uh, as far as the light, it looks pretty much similar. Not quite as noticeable as what we're going to encounter come Monday. Yeah. And so, in fact, if you look at the map here, these show a bunch of eclipses over some time period, 2021 to 2040. Um, the eclipse that Dr. Johnson was talking about is that red one that crosses right through Texas and crosses with another one. So the red one being the annular eclipse that he saw. And um, guess what that blue one is? That's the one that's going to happen in two days. Um, and you'll notice, like, one is going one direction, and the other is going the other direction. And the thing to note there is the, the eclipse that you saw happened when? October. October 14th. October 14th. And ours is going to happen in April. So we got a difference of fall and spring. And as Dr. Jones was talking about, the slant of the moon's orbit is what um, makes it not happen all the time. But also, depending where in the orbit you are, it will determine which way you're going across the sky. So you can see there's lots of different um, annular eclipses and, and total eclipses that are going to happen, you know, in the next 20 years or so. And um, so thinking back to what we were just talking about a minute ago, why were some of these annular and some of them total eclipses? We said it was the, the distance that the, the moon was from our eye, the Earth, um, as to whether or not that would cover up the sun completely. And so it seems like if we have total and annular eclipses, that um, not all the time is the moon exactly the same distance away from the Earth. And that, in fact, is exactly what happens. So we think usually of the moon as orbiting the Earth in a perfect circle, but it's a little bit different than that. It's slightly squashed. It's an ellipse. And so sometimes the moon is closer, sometimes it's further. And, and additionally, the Earth's orbit around the sun is a little bit wonky as well. So we get different ratios of the distances between the Earth and the moon and the Earth and the sun. So another really cool thing that happens because of the moon are tides. Uh, you've heard of Lake, not necessarily just the ocean, it's not an ocean phenomenon, it's any large body of water, you're going to see noticeable tides. Why do we have these? Anybody know? The students in the front row seem to know what the answer is. Fred, you got a thought? All right, so we pull on the moon. We have a gravitational attraction to the moon. Some people say gravity is kind of a downer for them. I don't know. I think gravity is fairly attractive, actually. Um, I like gravity. I like talking about it. I like thinking about it. But, uh, yeah, we pull on the moon with a gravitational force. The moon pulls back on us with a gravitational force. What is most of the Earth covered with? Dr. Jones said that. I just was seeing if you were paying attention. There is a quiz after this. I hope you know that. You taking notes? Well, at least you're paying attention. All right, you answered my question. That's better than some of my classes. So, yeah, we are pulling on the moon. It's pulling back on us. Most of the Earth is covered in water. What else is the Earth doing, by the way? Spinning around, right? Okay, cool. Cool. All right. So, 
part of it is that the, the moon is pulling on the Earth, too, and the stuff closest is getting pulled more than the stuff farther away. And um, some of that thing that's getting pulled is movable, like water, right? So it is going to pull some of that water, and the water can move, giving us a tidal bulge on the side closest to the moon. But it's also spinning. What happens when something spins? So as the moon spins around the Earth, in order to keep everything in balance, I have to pull on the bowling ball, and guess what? The bowling ball pulls on me. That's the near side. The far side, notice when I'm spinning, I have to lean backward because my inertia, in order to keep things balanced, needs to have both the pull towards the moon and the pull on the other side, meaning that the bulge is going to occur on both sides of the Earth. I thought we were going to throw that in the audience. Oh, yeah. I meant, I meant to throw that at you guys. So we have these bulges on the side closest to the moon and the side farther away from the moon. And inside of those tidal bulges, the Earth is still spinning, it's still rotating. So it's not so much the tide going in and out, it's that we are spinning into and out of these high tide areas. Right, and so every day, um, the Earth is composed of both oceans and continents, and the oceans are a little bit more pliable than the continents. So as um, the continents spin into that bulge, you get uh, ocean water coming up onto the shore, and that's the high tide. And then as the continent spins away from the bulge, that's the low tide going out. Now, you may be thinking out in the audience that, yes, this is interesting science, and, and yes, that is, that is nice to know things. I do like knowing things. But what does that have to do with an eclipse? What, if anything, does that have to do with an eclipse? Well, a day is how long it takes the Earth to spin around one rotate. Roughly speaking, a month is how long it takes the moon to go around the Earth. So the spin rate for the Earth is much faster than the spin rate for the moon. And uh, I'll tell you a story. I have a son. He's 13 now. But when he was little, I'd try to take him places. And sometimes he wouldn't want to go to those places. So I'd have to pull him along. And uh, I tell you, it slowed me down a lot. And in a similar kind of way, as the Earth is spinning faster than the moon, it's kind of pulling it along, and it's getting slowed down as well. But we have this thing called angular momentum. you want to talk about that? Yeah, yeah. And so, um, as Dr. Johnson was just mentioning, the, the spinning of the Earth and the turbulence of the, the tides on the short line and all kinds of stuff that's going on inside the Earth uh, makes the Earth slow down. Um, and things that are spinning have um, this quantity that we call angular momentum. Um, and so our days are getting longer as time goes on because the Earth is slowing down. Um, it, it used to be the case that millions of years ago the day was only 23 and a half hours long, and now it's quite a bit longer. Um, but as I said, this quantity of angular momentum has to be conserved. If the Earth slows down, that angular momentum that it's lost from spinning around and around has to go somewhere. So the mystery of where the Earth's angular momentum goes when it slows down is that it makes the moon go further away. What happens to eclipses if the Earth is moving farther and farther away from the Earth? When you move your thumb away from your face, do you get more total eclipses or more annular eclipses? That's right. I heard somebody saying you get more annular eclipses. So as the Earth slows down, the moon gets further away, and we'll have lots of uh, total eclipses. But in fact, we're past the point where we have more total eclipses than annular eclipses. We have more annular eclipses now. 
And it's just going to continue to be more and more and more and more annular eclipses until someday, millions of years, maybe even close to a billion years from now, the last total eclipse will occur on Earth. Expected him to hit me way harder than that. He was being nice. <laughs> So, during the eclipse, some really cool stuff happens. Uh, it gets dark. That's really cool because it's daytime. It'll actually look like twilight with the, the sunset all around you. So, on all horizons, you'll see what looks like a sunset. It's really cool. Uh, you'll be able to see the outer atmosphere of the sun, um, which you can't normally see. It's normally drowned out by the, the main body of the sun. You can't see it, but when you cover out the main body of the sun, you can. It's visible. Uh, you can also see the mountains on the moon. It's super cool. It's called Bailey B. As it's covering up the, uh, as the moon is covering up the sun, you'll see the shadow of the mountains on the moon because it's not perfectly round. Um, you'll be able to see planets that you wouldn't normally see because it's daytime and you can't normally see them during the day. I, I think, I'm pretty sure, Venus is going to breathe the brightest object in the sky during the total eclipse. Like, nothing else in the sky will be brighter than Venus when the sun is behind the moon. So, in fact, you'll see anything that's up there that you normally wouldn't see because it's drowned out by the sunlight because the sunlight's going to be covered up. Except, I suppose, the stuff that is behind the sun, right? I wouldn't be able to see the stuff that's covered up by the sun because the sun's being covered up by the moon, right? Right? Would I ask that if that was right? No. A really, really cool thing happens. So, um, one of the nice things about the total eclipse is that things that are near to the sun that you normally wouldn't be able to see, because the sun is just so bright, um, they'll, they'll be able to be visible. Like some faint stars that are close to the sun would be drowned out by the sun. But then, um, you know, when the moon covers it, you'll be able to see those. And scientists made an interesting observation. If we track these three stars that we see during the solar eclipse, and then track them afterward. You catch it? I'll do it one more time. They're closer together than they actually appear. They're closer together than they actually appear. Why? Right. So I've, I've exaggerated it a little bit here, of course. Um, it's actually very uh, faint um, effect. But the, the stars do appear further apart when the sun is in their presence. So to understand this, we have to look at a, a different concept that is uh, similar in its effect, but different in its origin. The idea here is that our brains, while they are amazing machines and are really good at what they do, have a few interesting, uh, we'll say, quirks that we can take advantage of. One thing that our brains do, just by default, automatically, is assume that light travels in a straight line. Because light normally travels in a straight line. I've got a laser pointer in my pocket. If I was to shine it at you, it would go directly to you. It would not pass go. It wouldn't curve. It wouldn't bend. It would just go right to you and hit you. That's what a laser does. It travels in a straight line, and our brains interpret light as going in a straight line. And that normally is the case, and it works pretty well for us except when that light encounters something else, like going through matter. It's like a boundary between water and air. When light goes from one material to another material, that transition changes the speed of that light. And by changing the speed of that light, it's like when you um, are mowing your lawn, you push the lawnmower and the edge of it goes off into the grass, off of like, the, the paved driveway. It slows down, changes the speed, and all of a sudden it changes the direction. When you change the speed of something, you tend to change the direction of that something, and that's what happens through the light. That pencil is not broken. It's just that the light from the top comes directly to our eyes. The light from the bottom bends when it gets to the border of the water and the air. And our brain interprets that as having come from a different place. So our brain assumes it's going in a straight line, but it isn't. So we have a little diagram to help understand how that works. It also will help you if you're a spear fisherman. Just if there's any of you in the audience, I thought there might be. So uh, what your brain uh, would imagine is that the light of some fish in the ocean. Um, light hits the fish, bounces off, comes to your eyes, you see the fish, and your brain's like, oh, it should travel in a straight line out of the water at the person. But 
like we just mentioned, when it hits the surface between the water and the air, what actually happens is that the light bends away and it no longer gets to your eyes. It misses you completely. So you say, well, I can't see the fish. But in reality, there's more than one light ray coming off of the fish. So what actually is happening is that the light travels in a slightly different pattern, path, one that doesn't look like it's going to hit you, and then when it hits the surface of the water, it bends and is able to get to your eye. Of course, your eye, as we mentioned, perceives that as being a straight line. So what it does is it pre uh, produces a, a phantom image where your brain thinks that the fish is, but it actually isn't. That's not where the fish is. That's just where the light is perceived by your brain to have come from. So I'm spear fishing. I take my spear and I aim right at the fish and I miss somehow. I aimed right where it was, but that's not where it was. I would actually want to aim a little bit below where it looks like it is because the light bending makes it look above where it actually is. So, um, this was a, a little bit of a tangent. We were talking about the stars and the sky, and then all of a sudden we're talking about pencils and waters and, and fish. But what, what um, was discovered, or there were discoveries, but there was also um, proposals for why these discoveries were being made, one of them being that uh, Albert Einstein in uh, 1915 published a paper on what's called general relativity. And in that, what he proposed is that objects that are large, really anything that has mass, but the effect is bigger for bigger and bigger objects, um, it causes space to actually warp and bend. So light, which normally travels in a straight line near a large object, will follow that curved space. And as it does, the light from a star behind the sun could actually bend and go around our sun. And so the light from that star, as you see up there, doesn't follow a straight path into the sun where we wouldn't be able to see it. It goes around and comes to the Earth. But what does our brain perceive that light as having done? Or our telescopes, I guess. Traveling in a straight line. So, what you actually perceive is the star as being in a different location than what you would see if the sun weren't there. And so that's exactly the effect that we showed at the beginning, where the stars, near the, when the sun is there, are further out than when they are, when the sun is not there at all. And so, um, the, the first time that this was really uh, confirmed experimentally, was in an experiment performed uh, in 1919, not too long after Einstein published his paper. The fact that it's um, more massive, the sun indents space more, we have to have a really massive thing to bend space in a noticeable way. So that's why the eclipse in particular is useful. It, first of all, drowns out the light, letting us see those stars that we couldn't see otherwise. But it's also a very massive thing, the ma most massive thing nearby. So it's going to be the one that is bending space the most and give us the most visible uh, observation of this phenomenon. So, uh, switching gears a little bit, coming back to the sun and, and thinking a little bit more about what's going on near the uh, sun during the eclipse, uh, we uh, also are able to see the outer reaches of the sun that are, again, normally, they're, they're visible, but not as well when the solar eclipse is happening. So, if you look carefully, what you'll see as the total eclipse happens is um, around the edge of the moon, this bright sort of halo of wispy light, um, which is actually the sun's upper atmosphere, uh, called the corona. And um, that corona is um, often responsible for the thing we call solar wind, where it throws charged particles at the Earth. Fortunately, we're protected by the Earth's magnetic field. So, uh, the corona of the sun is a lot less dense than the rest of it. And, um, in fact, the sun has big, gigantic magnetic fields that are very, very strong, and it causes that material to be warped and pulled and looped around the sun. And so, um, in the corona, you see these bright bands of light where the particles are being pulled by the magnetic field. So, some prior observations of the corona suggests that it's much hotter than the actual, once you get down to the denser surface of the sun, 
the surface is roughly around you know, 5,500 degrees Celsius, already pretty hot. But these observations suggest that the uh, corona is thought to be somewhere between a million and two million degrees Celsius. And in fact, um, there is a uh, astronomer who uh, planned during this eclipse, we're not going to go into much detail here, but they plan to use the eclipse as an opportunity to study in detail more the corona and try to figure out exactly what is the corona made of for sure and why is this weird effect where the outer edge of the surface is, or of the sun is a lot hotter than um, if you go more towards the middle. So uh, that's where we wanted to leave you guys today. Um, I think we're going to come back out for questions. But yeah. I hope you enjoyed our talk. In the meantime, Dr. Nick Lang. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, I have a, I guess my MO was following incredible presentations. Um, so that was absolutely amazing. Uh, Clint and then Joe and Brad's presentation. So I hope I can follow that up. I did have the, um, I guess, non-privilege of following somebody who sang the presentation one time. So um, that, was, that was difficult enough. But um, what I want to do here is talk about, let's bring that up here. Talk about, uh, one of the players that are involved with the eclipse. And so, who can say, there are three players involved with the eclipse. Who can just say, it? what are they? What do you need to have the eclipse? You have the sun. Exactly. What else do you need? The moon. And the earth. That's right. You have three different players involved. Where is my presentation? Why is this not coming up? Blah, blah, blah. There we go. And you need a, how do we get this presenting on the, on the screen here? There we go. All right. Thank you. All right. So, I, so we have the sun, the moon, and the earth. All right. So we kind of break that up into teams, right? Which team are you on? Right? When it comes to the eclipse, which team are you on? I'm team moon. All right? And I get to talk to you about that team. So I'm going to wrap up our presentation today by talking about what it is about the moon. Joe had a, a really nice uh, sort of discussion about the moon in terms of it, its, its shape, right? It's this, we tend to think of it as sort of this, it's round and we see in the sky, but it's not perfectly round. It has topography on it, right? So if we look at the moon here in this image, we see this sort of these big sort of dark spots in there with these uh, lighter colored areas as well. Like that's when you look at the full moon at night, right? We have a uh, full moon a couple weeks ago. A couple more weeks, we'll have another full moon. When you look at that, this is what you're going to see. These dark patches that we call the Mari. Then we have the lighter colored areas that we call the highlands. So these are some really cool patches of the moon, but we don't exactly see this on Earth. And why? And what exactly... What are those differences that, between the Earth and the Moon? So we see some different sort of surface changes, some different uh, difference in the, in the surface there. But what else do we see that's different? Well, the sizes are a lot different, right? The Earth is almost 8,000 miles in diameter. The Moon is about 2,200 miles in diameter. So if you put that into perspective, if you go from the East Coast of the United States to the West Coast, that's about 2,600 miles, right? So that, to put that into perspective. So this is a lot different. So, but the Earth has a nice tilt to it of 23 degrees. The Moon is not as tilted. Temperatures vary uh, on both bodies. Earth is a lot more narrow in its range. The Moon really varies by a lot. In fact, in some parts of the Moon that are permanently shadowed, it's so cold that ice is still there. You have water ice that's frozen down there. So in the southern part, if you get close to the south pole of the Moon, it gets, it's really cold. And that's why we're actually going to put astronauts there in two years. In 2026, the fall of 2026, we're going to actually have astronauts landing on the moon again as part of what's called Artemis III. And they're going to land there, and they need that water ice to be able to, to, to survive there and to be able to just to function in that location. So this is really, it's really neat that we have that sort of this, these really, really cool parts there. Earth, we have an atmosphere. The moon, we don't have an atmosphere. And so we have, you know, the Earth is dominated by, by water, the moon has no liquid water on its surface. We have ice, as I said, but 
you are, but what we're finding is that the moon, we used to think that the moon was bone dry. It means there was no water whatsoever. But in addition to this water ice we're finding, we're finding that there's water locked up in minerals on the moon as well. So the moon may have been wetter in its past. We've had a, a much wetter past than we actually have to give it credit for. And along those same lines, we have some, some additional differences, right? So because we have an atmosphere, because we have liquid water, we have a lot of erosion on the, on the Earth. So basically, you, take, you build something up, it's going to get torn down. Right? The, wa- the wind, the water, is going to act on that and bring it all down. On the moon, we don't have so much of that. There's no, there's no real wind on the moon. We have, uh, but there, we do have something similar that's ubiquitous, and that is impact craters, right? So we have these things that have barreled through from outer space and slammed into our surfaces here. It's very hard to find those on Earth because we have erosion. So the, this erosion is sort of really sort of hidden a lot of these impact craters. On the moon, you look at it, you have big, big impact craters. So we have these Mari, and we also have a lot smaller impact craters as well. In fact, the parts of the moon are so saturated with impact craters that you cannot form a new one without destroying an old one. Right? So it's a saturated surface. The moon actually has earthquakes, and this is something that's, or moonquakes, technically, and that's something that actually is a uh, concern because if we put astronauts back on the moon, right, the, the moon is, is shaking. We have to have infrastructure that's actually going to support that shaking. Right? There was an earthquake yesterday on the East Coast, a pretty significant earthquake, actually, the one that you can really feel. Right? It's kind of scary on the East Coast because the infrastructure is not there to support the, that earthquake. We have to think about that when going to the moon. We can't just build something that can't, with hand, with, uh, with, that can stand, that can't stand shaking. So, but we have these differences and, and a little bit of similarities between these bodies. So then that raises the question, well, if the moon is largely different than the Earth, how did it form? Where did it come from? And that's the question I want to get at with you for the rest of this presentation here. Where did that come from? Where did the moon originate? And so if we're going to do that, we have to take some observations into play, right? That's what we do in, in science. We, we take observations and we formulate those into a best guess or a hypothesis. And so here, the biggest things we need to take into account is that the moon is a lot lighter than the Earth, not just in color, but also in basically its weight, right? It's, it's less dense than the Earth. It has a lot less iron. The element iron is a lot less on the moon than it is on the Earth. But the moon has a lot more elements of titanium and aluminum. All right? So you have to explain why that's the case. And we didn't know this until 1969, really. But the moon's chemical signature, well, if we take a look at the chemistry on the moon, it's actually fairly similar to the mantle of the Earth, which is really weird. So until about 1969, these were the dominant hypotheses that explain the moon's formation. The moon basically formed at the same part of the solar system as the Earth did. The solar system formed 4.6 billion years ago. So billion with a B. The moon, the idea, one of the ideas at the time was that the moon formed at the exact same time as the Earth. Another is that we had the gravity of the Earth. The moon sort of was this object for going through the solar system and it got captured by the Earth kind of got pulled in, and it's now swinging around the Earth, as we saw with our demonstrations in our last presentation. The other idea here was that the Earth spun so fast that basically you just popped off the, off the moon. All right, so these are some the dominant ideas. Then 1969 came around. What happened in 1969 to help us answer this question? What was it? Just say it. We put people on the moon. Exactly right. We had had... Apollo 11 that landed, and they collected a boatload or a spacecraft load of samples and brought those back to the Earth. National treasures that are at Johnson Space Center in Houston and at various institutions across the country. And they are also, like, they, they've been preserving those, and now we are able to go back and take a look at them in a lot more detail. We've got much better chemical analyses that we can do. We have machines that can actually do a much higher precision measurements. And that's how we're seeing that there's actually water trapped in some of these minerals on the moon. So, based on those samples, we had a new idea that came up. So a little bit of a, uh, a li- borrowing a little bit of each of those ideas there. Basically, the idea that's, this is the idea that's still the dominant theory for the moon's formation today, is that basically the moon was born of the Earth, 
But it wasn't that the moon was spinning, the earth was spinning so fast it bore out the moon. It was that something super huge hit into the earth. Basically, something that was Mars-sized, Mars is half the size of the earth, something that large slammed into the earth early in the earth's formation, right? The earth is 4.6 billion years old, and it was a chaotic place. You have all these objects that were slamming, going around, slamming together, breaking apart, coming back together to build planets and moons and basically what's left over in the asteroid belt. So something very large came in, hit the Earth, the Earth melted, some of it came out, and it formed the moon. That explained why the moon has a lot less iron than the Earth, why you have a lot of aluminum and titanium on the moon. Why that composition? When we look at the chemistry of the moon, that chemistry is similar to the mantle of the Earth. Right? Basically, the mantle is what gave birth to the moon. The mantle is this really, really thick layer of the Earth that sits under us. It's, we're on the crust of the Earth. It's this layer that sits under. The mantle is what sits under us on the Earth here. So, all of this explains so much about the moon, moon's history. But just kind of go through this, so what this would have happened. So you would have had, as we see in this picture here, you have something very large slamming into the Earth, and that would have thrown a lot of material out that's surrounding the Earth. The Earth cooled. It was a sort of what we call a magma ocean. It was basically just magma. This hot, molten stuff. And then all this other stuff that was around it started to cool. It was going around. It accumulated. Things were still going crazy, hitting each other in the solar system, around the Earth, building the moon to come up. The Earth was still getting hit by things. Then eventually you left, we were left with this sort of this spherical object that went around the moon, or the Earth. That was our moon. That's how our moon formed. That doesn't, that we don't say that that's how all moons in the solar system are formed. Right? So we have all these bodies around Jupiter, around Saturn, Mars' is two moons, Neptune, Uranus. We don't, those, doesn't explain how all those formed, but our own moon this is the way we explain it, that something as large as Mars slammed into us. So that gives us what we have today. But it doesn't explain why it looks like this. Why does it have these big dark patches and these lighter patches? Well, basically, if we want to talk about those. The light areas are what we call highlands, the lunar highlands. And they're high because they're actually topographically high. They are composed of very light minerals, something that we call plagioclase. And if I, I'm a geologist, I'm going to throw out the term anorthosite. That means nothing to you, but all that means is a rock that is dominated by the mineral plagioclase, most common mineral in the, in the Earth, most common mineral on the moon, plagioclase. This is a very light mineral. So if you have something that's molten, something like a magma, it actually floats to the top like an ice cube. And so all this white area, all this light-colored area on the moon is these mineral plagioclase that basically float. When this was all molten, all these minerals basically just floated to the surface of the moon. And then basically you had heavier minerals that then were below that. You almost had this almost a stratification of minerals underneath that there. But, so that explains why we have the light areas. Why do we have the dark areas? Right, so the moon formed after the Earth was formed. The moon formed 4.6 billion years ago. The moon formed very soon after that, 4.5 billion years ago. It was still during a period of active bombardment, what we call, we had all these big objects slamming into the moon, still, slamming into the Earth. So some big objects slammed in to create these dark, spat, pot, dark patches. They weren't dark at the time. That came later. But during this time of really heavy bombardment, you created these, some of these Big craters. If you have a telescope, you can see these at night, during a full moon. Or if you have a really good binoculars, you might be able to see this during when the moon is closer in its orbit. But you have these big impact craters that are there. Some have like double rings, others don't. But if we take a look at this image on the left, you can see that it's dark and smooth. That's actually lava that erupted about a billion years after these impact craters formed. So you have these craters that formed, sat there for about a billion years, and then lava erupted out from the bottom of these craters and basically just leaked up and filled these impact craters. It looks very smooth, and that's actually where we landed our astronauts. The last mission to go to the moon, that we put people on the moon, 
with Apollo 17, and it landed on the edges of one of these uh, craters here to basically look at, we wanted samples from the highlands there to bring those back. But we have all these samples from the lunar maria, these dark, smooth patches, and that dominates our collection of, of, of materials from them, these national treasures that we have. I'm going to skip that really quickly. But So we have impact craters that have formed on the moon, but the other process is my favorite, which is volcanism. You had lava that erupted out, and basically, some of that erupted was so fluid that it basically carved these big channels on the moon. And they formed these, they're called rills, and so one of the places where you commonly see this is uh, Aristarchus Plateau. You can see this big rill, this big sort of channel right there in the middle, right? You're not looking at something that's kind of shallow. You're looking at something that's like almost, like, it's incredibly deep, tens to hundreds of meters deep, right? So if you're standing there, it's dwarfing you. It's almost like standing in the Grand Canyon to give you some idea of perspective. So that tells you that there was a lot of lava that came out. And to kind of give you a perspective, this is Mount Etna. This is a lava flow coming out of Mount Etna there on the right. And so you can see here, that's essentially a very miniaturized version of how the lava would have flowed on the moon. It would have been very fast, very fluid, almost like water. It wasn't water, but it was very fluid, almost like water, to be able to carve those channels. Some of that roofed over to form lava tubes. And that's actually what's really sort of important to think about lava tubes is that they roofed over there, we see evidence of them on the moon. We see they, these, these roofs collapse in to kind of give these sort of pitted appearance. But this is actually a place where you, you, you can protect astronauts. So there's an idea there's been a lot of work trying to understand lava tubes and where they could be on the moon because that could be a natural shelter for astronauts when we go back there. These roofs collapse in, so you need to be very stable. You have to reinforce them. If you have earthquakes, you want to be very careful. Or moonquakes, you need to be very careful. But this could be a natural shelter that we put people in. And so I think I'm over time here, and with that, I'm going to end here and remind you of the question, what team are you on? Are you Team Moon, Team Sun, or Team Earth? What I just went over is why I'm Team Moon, and I'll leave you there. Thank you very much. So, hey, so all of us are out here, obviously, now. We are happy to take any questions, comments that you may have. So, please, fire away. I think, is there a microphone going around? Yeah. Okay, so the microphone's on the side. So, yeah. Yeah, that's a great question. So um, basically, so when this thing came, when Mar Earth was hit, right, it, it melted. So everything, things just came out, they were molten. When things kind of hit together, right, it's this sort of chaotic environment, all this material gets thrown out, they're going to hit together too. They may hit each other with such energy that things actually melt. And so as that happens, as things come together, they melt, cool, you have the spinning as well. As my colleagues in physics were talking about here, right, you've got the spinning, this angular momentum there. It ends up basically the physics of that causes things to get round. And I'm sure they can speak about this way more clearly than I can. But essentially it's just that the spinning effect is what causes things to, to basically turn into a, into a sphere there. And that's also why when the, you know, why things don't kind of are this giant cloud as well during that formation. It may start off that way, but as things are spinning, the physics, the physics of that causes things to basically like, come into a lens there, more, more, mostly. So, but that's just, it's just the physics of it. I, I feel like that was a pretty good description. Um, if you still have questions about that, we could address them as well. I'll start. So I was in Tennessee in 2017. Um, that was my first uh, eclipse. And um, 
I, I had some awareness of this going in, uh, but I feel like being my first Eclipse, I, I didn't even really get uh, a good feel for it uh, when I was there. I want to see it again. Uh, which is that if you look carefully on the ground, um, I think it's leading right up and right after, maybe a little bit during, um, on the ground you'll see little waves of light moving around, which is extremely interesting. Um, and there's a little bit of uh, physics there with like how light passes through the atmosphere and stuff. But it, it is a subtle, but also, you know, because everything else is going on, you're gonna, you might miss it. But it is really interesting to just look around and see that. I have a second one, but I don't, somebody else might say it, so <laughs> I'll, I'll let them answer as well. I'm actually most interested in um, animal behavior. Uh, I want to see what the animals do. I have two birds at home, and I've already focused a camera on them, and I plan to like, go on my Ring app and look at that. So if you see me looking down at my phone during an eclipse, it's, I'm not ignoring it. I'm watching my birds. So, yeah, um, nature is is going to adapt. We're going to, we're going to get a drop in temperature as well um, once we reach totality. So, interested in those effects. Similar to uh, to Brad's answer, I am um, super interested in, in how the shadows are going to be forming. If you um, have an L-shaped uh, object that has uh, flat edges, the edges that are parallel to the um, the crescent of the moon, of the uh, sun that's covered up by the moon. Uh, those will be really sharp. The shadows will be really sharp. The ones that are perpendicular to the crescent are going to be really fuzzy because of the same physics phenomenon. And I'm like super excited to see that. It's silly, but I'm like, I can't wait. Also, um, there's, have you ever heard of a pinhole camera? So um, anything can be a pinhole camera. It's just focusing light through some aperture. So uh, if you look at like shadows of trees, the leaves become all the, the light getting through become a bunch of little pinhole cameras. So the, all of those shadows are going to show little crescents as the, uh, the sun gets covered up. So that's going to be really interesting. To, to piggyback on this answer, I am going to be carrying a colander with me and a manila folder with an L-shaped cutout, just so I can see both of those things. So uh, bring your colander. <laughs> right. Yeah, if you use a colander, don't strain your eyes. But um, I'm really interested in, um, basically, I've never seen a total solar eclipse. I've seen lunar eclipses, but I've never seen a total solar eclipse. So I'm just, like, excited to see that in general and just how dark is it going to get. And as Clint was alluding to, right, animal behavior is going to be really interesting. We you know that the cornerstone of science is replication, right? You need to be able to replicate your results. And... Lunar eclipses, or solar eclipses, are so rare. Total solar eclipses are so rare. Nowhere in the world, if you look over a 5,000-year period, gets more than 25 total solar eclipses over that over a 5,000-year period. Right? These are incredibly rare events. And so because of that, you know, thinking about what happens on the Earth, what happens with animals, it's really hard to, so, to replicate that because you just don't see it. And it's just, it's, there's stories. And, like, there's this really cool story... Um, about in, in the 1850s in uh, Sweden, there was a, a solar eclipse that an, a, a line of ants were marching carrying food and they stopped. They just froze for the entire t duration of, of totality. Once totality was over, they started moving again. Right? Why? Like, that's just insane. You know, fireflies have come out and flash their lights. And uh, you and I can see that in Erie in April, but you know, it's just this, it's that behavior that's just so, so intriguing. And so, yeah, I think that's just something that is just going to be really amazing to watch. And if you're interested in, in participating in that, I have to as a, um, I have to promote this. But citizen science, right? There's this, NASA's doing a lot with citizen science, and I encourage you to try and do that. There's one that's called Eclipse Soundscapes. And it's this free app that's put up by NASA, Eclipse Soundscapes, where you can actually make those observations. So if you want to think about what are animals doing, you can go out and actually make those observations and record those on your phone. Clint, I'll talk about temperature and clouds, right? That's something else you can record as well. There's something called Globe Observer. So if you're interested in that, if you're like, yeah, I'm really, really interested in this, yeah, like record your observations and record it and report it for scientists to be able to incorporate into the data set there. That's the other thing I'm really interested in. You're social sci you mentioned you're a social scientist, right? I think just thinking about how people are, are responding to that is another really intriguing thing to, to consider there. So. I think it's worth mentioning that those effects don't happen outside of the path of totality. Like, yeah. you still get effects, but not those things that yeah. we're talking about. This is special to 
being in that path. So nowhere else besides that path is going to see those particular effects. Yeah, they are. Yeah, yeah they're going to be open, and um, they encourage people to come in and watch the animals' behavior. Yes, sir. That's an excellent question. Um, yeah, so basically how the question is, if I'm understanding your, the way you're asking, so please correct me if I'm wrong, is basically how do any sort of variations in sort of temperature, cloud cover, how is that going to impact not just the experience of people watching the eclipse, but also how we record data from the eclipse? I don't have a great answer to that. My my expectation is there's enough people who are recording this, who are doing these measurements, um, who are in its path of totality, that I think that might, my prediction is that that's going to basically smooth out any, any sort of variances that might exist there. Right? We have a plane that's going to be following the path of totality as best it can right? to measure air, air, effect, uh, air pressure effects. And, um, we have sounding rockets that are being launched off from wallets, one about 30 minutes before totality, one during totality, and one about 30 minutes after totality. They're going to actually be uh, recording basically air pressure, the ionization in the, uh, the ionosphere, right? It's going to be measuring all of those. So there's so many things that are going on that I think that it won't really matter because there's going to be enough locations doing it. I don't think you should worry about that. Round numbers, it's about 100 miles. It's going to vary based on whether you are, right, because as, as Clint was talking about, the orbit is not perfectly circular. It's elliptical. So there's points where it's further away, points where it's closer to the Earth. And so when it's further away from the Earth, when the moon is further away in its orbit, from the eclipse, that path, that shadow is going to be narrower. But if you are closer to the Earth, that path is going to be wider. But it's not, it's not a huge difference. Round numbers, it's about 100 miles. So basically, for when it's over Erie, to use some sort of sense perspective, it's going to stretch from southern Canada down to just past Meadville. So that's about how wide that path is going to be. And you'll, you'll see articles where they revise that estimate a little bit. You're talking like feet revising. So it's like Christ is making a big deal about path of totality has changed. No, it's just it's been revised by a couple feet. to accept it's going to be cloudy, I think. Um, how does that impact how we're going to be able to see the sun and the corona? Can you see it? Yeah, so um, it depends on the types of clouds and their elevations, of course. Um, high, we, you know, we would want high clouds um, that would move quickly. If we have a haze, it's obviously going to obscure our observation of, of the sun and moon system, it's still going to, going, going to get dark. Um, and the corona, I, I mean... If it's hazy, I... Yeah, that's a great question about the corona. I think you would see more obscur uh, obscuring of the corona if there's, like, hazy clouds or something high up. Um, but, you know, eclipses impact weather, or impact clouds. And that's the other thing to keep in mind, is that how much it impacts, I don't know. But there's this really cool video of, and I forget which eclipse it is, but if you look, it's focused on the Yucatan Peninsula. And very cloudy location, socked in by clouds. Over the course of the eclipse, of an eclipse, the clouds cleared out. And then when the eclipse is over, the clouds moved in. So there actually could be a pretty big impact, no pun intended, on the eclipse event during, um, as it progresses, if it's cloudy that day. So, I know you're, I, 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 I hear your pessimism. I have colleagues who are pessimistic about it too. But I am an eternal optimist, and I, I am going for the moon is going to really come through. 
<laughs> it'll still get dark. It'll still get cold. Yeah. We'll still observe changes. Hopefully and we'll we still have plenty to do on campus. <laughs> <laughs> we have planned for that. And in case we cannot see it, we will live stream it yeah. here at several locations on campus. So, I have a question. Um, the Oregon eclipse was two minutes and something, and this is three minutes and something. And is that um, having to do with how close we are to the moon or not? As it goes up in the totality um, path, are there different amounts of times it's totally covered? Yeah, you're talking about what determines the length of time of totality? Yeah, so that mainly has to do with the Earth's rotation on its axis. So as the Earth is revolving around the sun, it's also rotating on its axis. And, and we were talking about the definition of a day. The Earth rotates through approximately a degree um, every four minutes or so. And... If we think about it, if we're rotating and revolving, we're doing two motions. So it takes us as, and I'm, this is highly exaggerated, if I rotate around and I revolve, if I want to point back to Dr. Trees, I have to go a little bit more. So there's a difference between what we call a solar day, which we would need to point back at the sun, which is a little bit more. Than 360 degrees around, than a sidereal day, which is what we would need to point to far out stars. So it has to really do with that rotation of the Earth. So as that moon is coming and going, we're seeing the Earth in its rotation. Um, secondary effect is your latitude, right? So yeah. the rotation rate is pretty fixed. Well, it's completely fixed everywhere on Earth. But whether you're at the equator, latitude changes, and so the rate at which you're moving also changes. So um, you're going to get longer eclipses um, the higher in latitude that you are. Okay. Very good. <laughs> okay. Well, thank you all once again. Um, Here's to uh, a sunny, yet moon-filled day on Monday. <laughs>